So, we got a brand new Crash game. What the crap? It only feels like yesterday that we were still in that near decade-long hibernation state of the Crash Bandicoot series, with no word on a new Crash game happening beyond rumors that pop up every once in a while. Then, bam, the original trilogy gets remade. Then, bam, the original trilogy remakes come to a Nintendo platform. Then, bam, CTR gets remade. And then finally, after all this excitement and love towards Crash's roots, bam, a brand new Crash game happens. The first brand new Crash game in 12 years. This is the reality we live in now, and my inner child couldn't be any happier. Now originally, I was planning on making Crash Bandicoot 4 my next review, since, well, momentous occasion and all. But then I realized, I haven't actually reviewed the original trilogy on my channel yet. And given this is a direct follow-up to the original trilogy, I think it'd be fitting that I give those games a look first. Now granted, I did look at Wrath of Cortex beforehand, which was the original Crash 4, but to that I say, Wrath of Cortex didn't have a 4 in its title aside from in Japan, so that's different. Regardless, to celebrate the arrival of Crash 4, I'm going to take a look back at the original trilogy. And to make things more interesting, I'm going back to the original original trilogy. I haven't touched the PS1 versions of the original Crash games since the Insane trilogy came out in 2017, so I think this ought to make for a fun revisit. With that said, let's not waste any more time and get right into it, starting with... Now, as a quick disclaimer to what I said before, I have actually done a Crash 1 review video in the past, back before I rebranded my channel. However, that was back when I was, well, not very good at reviewing, and as some of you will quickly realize, my thoughts on the game back then haven't quite held up. I mean, it's still really difficult, but never to a cheap state. <laughs> but we'll get there when we get there. So to go through a quick history lesson, the original Crash Bandicoot was released in late 1996 on the PS1, landing as one of the first notable 3D platformers in the gaming market alongside Mario 64 and... Yeah. Developed by the then-unknown Naughty Dog, long before they became one of the front-running studios of the AAA market, for better or for worse, Crash 1 was published by Sony themselves and pushed as an unofficial mascot for the relatively new console, in an attempt to compete with the juggernaut that was Mario. And while yes, Mario won the war in the long run, Crash still managed to snag a following, with Crash 1 becoming one of the PS1's best-selling titles, and even nowadays, despite being a multi-console series, many still view Crash as the PlayStation's former mascot. So hey, Sony's plan worked to an extent. So despite the essay's worth of backstory and lore that had been written for the game, Crash 1's story is as simple as you can get. You play as Crash Bandicoot. What's a Bandicoot, you ask? Good question. Anyway, Crash was an ordinary Bandicoot who got mutated by the evil scientists Dr. Neocortex and Dr. Nitrous Brio, with the intent of using him as the commander of their world-conquering mutant army. However, their experiment failed and Crash managed to escape. But with his mutated Bandicoot girlfriend Tana now at risk of going through the same treatment, it's now up to him to make his way back to Cortex's castle, save Tana, and stop Cortex and Brio. Like I said, simple as you can get. Going off the release documentation, there definitely seemed to be quite a lot more story stuff initially planned for the game, but I suppose that may have been a bit overscope and they had to dial it back. But either way, once Crash face plants on the beach of Sandy Island, you're right into your journey. So as I said earlier, Crash is a 3D platformer. But unlike Mario 64, which went ahead and established the open-level, mission-based collectathon style platformer that many 3D platformers use to this day, Crash decided to take a more literal approach to the idea of bringing 2D platformers into the third dimension. Lovingly referred to as the hallway platformer, Crash has much more linear, hallway-like level design. And heck, sometimes it just straight up goes the 2D platformer route. Now yes, Mario 64 was definitely more of an evolution of the platformer genre, but given the genre being in 3D was still new territory at the time, I can't blame Naughty Dog for the direction they went, and it definitely helps define Crash's identity as a series. That said, I don't think they quite hit their target on the first go. Not to say Crash 1 is an outright bad game, but it's definitely a victim of first game syndrome in a few different areas. Let's start with Crash himself. Ability-wise, Crash 1 keeps it simple. He can run, jump, and perform a spin attack. Nothing wrong with that for the first outing, but the problem here comes down to the controls. Movement feels incredibly stiff, not helped by there being a very slight delay in both starting and stopping running. It may not seem like much initially, but with some of the platforming challenges you have later on, that delay can very easily screw you over at points. Because the DualShock controller didn't exist yet, you're locked to using the D-pad for this game. And man, it does not take long for it to feel uncomfortable holding those buttons down for movement, especially in levels where you're constantly running like the boulder chase levels. The jumping is also rather heavy, which often makes it feel like you're going to undershoot jumps. And often, 
does result in undershooting jumps. This isn't helped by how, when jumping forward and landing on something, your forward momentum automatically continues once you're airborne again, which physics-wise makes sense, yes, but with how much they like to put crates on tiny platforms, combined with the stiff movement applying even when airborne, there were too many times to count where I jump on a crate and unintentionally plummet to my death right after. The stiff movement is probably at its worst with the Warthog levels though. There's two of these on-rail Warthog riding levels in the game, and let me just put it this way. Fast-paced on-rail sections that expect quick reactions, plus stiff movement, equals agony. The second one of these levels alone took me nearly 15 minutes to complete, and the level's only a minute long normally. This ain't helped by the fact that I was trying to get the gem, meaning I had to restart the level every time I died, regardless of checkpoints. I'll get to that point in a bit. Though on the topic of levels, I think the level design in this game is kinda hit and miss. At many points, it's actually quite alright, but every once in a while, it decides to throw a trick at you that just feels kinda cheap. Aside from the previously mentioned Warthog levels, sometimes the game will keep what you need to see off screen for a little longer than necessary, requiring blind leaps of faith or quick reactions, which is easier said than done. This is especially apparent any time the game wants you to move towards the camera, because the camera never pulls back enough for you to see what's coming up ahead before it's too late. This is most apparent with the boulder chase levels, as you're running towards the camera for the entirety of them, and oftentimes obstacles come up too quickly for you to react, especially if you're trying to get all the crates. Though easily the worst with the feeling of leaps of faith are the Dark Castle levels, where the gimmick is that Aku Aku, your mask that usually represents extra hit points, now serves as a source of light in this otherwise pitch black level, resulting in quite literal blind leaps of faith at points, and as light doesn't last forever, it extinguishes after a few seconds or if you get hit, putting you in complete darkness. I really don't like the intentionally poorly lit level trope as is, and these levels are a clear example as to why. Now this may sound like I'm complaining about the game being hard, but I should clarify. My problem isn't that the game is hard, but rather why it's hard. The stiff movement and the level design trickery are not a good combination, and it usually results in deaths that don't feel like your fault. And this is especially frustrating when you factor in some of Crash 1's other questionable design choices, namely gems and, by extension, the save system. So in Crash 1, there's two ways you're able to get the opportunity to save your progress either by completing one of Tana or Cortex's bonus rounds, or getting a gem. To do the latter, you need to break every single crate within a level, without dying once. You also use gems to get to the secret 100% ending, but still, that's kind of ridiculous. Well, that's okay, you just go back to a bonus round every time you want to save, right? Well, no. Once you beat a bonus round, they disappear forever. In other words, you have a limited number of times you can save in this game. I want to say this was a limitation or something, but more efficient save systems had long since been established in platformers, so I have no idea why this choice was made. Fortunately, this was not carried over into future Crash games, as wasn't the need to get all the crates without dying to get the gems. Definitely a good call. Now, I know I've been sounding like a negative Nancy for pretty much this entire segment, but I do want to clarify that there is some genuinely good stuff in this game. For one, for an early PS1 game, the graphics have actually held up pretty alright. Some of the characters look a bit janky, yes, but Crash himself still looks pretty good, and the environments especially still look really nice for the PS1. The cartoony aesthetics they chose to go for definitely paid off in the long run, given how blocky, realistic-looking humans tend to look in other PS1 games. And on the topic of environments, I quite like the overall thematic progression with the level settings, starting the game off in a more welcoming natural environment, before gradually progressing to the darker man-made temples, and eventually to the much colder power plant and castle. I don't know if the nature to man-made theme here was intentional, but if it was, then yeah, it's a nice touch. The soundtrack's also quite solid. Composed by the talented Josh Mansell, who also composed Crash 2 and 3, the game's full of beautifully atmospheric pieces that perfectly capture the tone of each area. Whether it's lively and natural sounding for the jungle areas, or more dark and ominous as you get further through Cortex's forces. And while I don't like the Warthog levels, I can't deny that the frantic nature of its music is pretty great to listen to. Also, while not great in execution, I do like the ideas behind some of the boss fights, namely the more puzzle-like structure of the Ripper Roo fight, and the whole duck and cover element of Pinstripe's battle. Though the fights with Embryo and Cortex are actually pretty good overall. But yeah, that just about covers everything with Crash 1. I definitely hold respect for it for being the first of the series and laying the foundation for this series, but man, it's not fun to go back to. I didn't even bother 100%ing the game this time around because it just got too stressful trying to get all the gems. How my younger self was able to pull this off, I'll never know. So yeah, if you do want to try Crash 1 out, just stick with the insane version. There's a proper save system, you don't need to get all the crates in one go to get the gems, aside from the colored gems, and the other little quality of life changes made do collectively make this even just a bit easier to play. There's really no reason to go back to the PS1 version if you ask me. But with that said, that's just the first venture of three. So let's continue onward to... Oh. Right. And somehow that's not even the most unpopular opinion I've got with this series. Just wait until you hear what I think about Crash Bandicoot 2. I can explain.
As a kid, I grew up with Crash 1 and Crash 3. And I mean like a little kid. I played both of these when I was 4 years old. Even though they were on complete polar opposites of the trilogy, I had gotten used to how they played pretty quickly. And then a few years down the road, I finally got my hands on Crash 2. Which, fun fact, I actually got this game from the Tooth Fairy. Yes, the Tooth Fairy got me a video game. I find it hard to believe too. Either way, being as familiar as I was with Crash 1 and 3, Crash 2 always felt off to me growing up. It felt like a weird middle ground between the two, and because of that, I played it far less than 1 and 3. And by the time the Insane trilogy came around, those old feelings carried over, and I honestly found myself liking it the least out of the trilogy. Not helped by other elements of the game that I didn't like that I'll get into later. Now that said, going into this return to the PS1 versions, I decided to go into Crash 2 with an open mind. Especially after playing Crash 1 again and realizing how much I didn't care for it anymore, I felt like the opposite effect could happen with Crash 2. And to put it simply... Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Now granted, I still have some issues with it, but yeah, I finally warmed up to Crash 2 after all these years. So now I can say that me liking tag team racing is my most controversial Crash opinion. So Crash 2 picks up right after Crash 1, with Cortex plummeting from his blimp after Crash defeated him. However, he survives his fall, finding himself in a cave with a mystical looking purple crystal, followed by him making a sound that I find way too amusing. <laughs> We then jump forward a year later, with Cortex now having a space station and a new assistant, the one and only best Crash character, Dr. Engine. It's revealed that the power crystal they snagged is a master crystal of sorts, but requires 25 additional power crystals to use its full potential. And with no other allies remaining, Cortex decides to yoink Crash from his peaceful life with Ta. Uh, wait, who are you? Yeah, during Crash 2's development, Tana was written out of the story, as the executives felt her design wasn't appropriate for a child-friendly game and wanted her redesigned. So she was removed and replaced by a new female lead, Crash's younger sister, Coco. How did Coco come into existence? And how did Coco find Crash? A complete and total mystery. Well, until the flashback tapes in Crash 4. Yep, took them almost my entire lifespan so far to reveal Coco's origins. That's a very weird way of thinking about it. But yeah, this time around, Cortex has Crash look for the various power crystals for him, tricking Crash into believing that he wants to use them to stop a solar flux that apparently threatens the Earth's very existence. And to think this all happened to Crash because Coco wanted him to get a laptop battery. I feel like this whole pretending to save the world lie Cortex makes up would work a bit better if we didn't have that cutscene at the start heavily hinting at the sinister nature of his plan, or if the game wasn't called, you know, Cortex strikes back, but I do appreciate the effort here. I also like that they address how Embryo's not working with Cortex anymore by actively having him working to stop Cortex's plans, and it's even heavily implied that he's the one sending the bosses after Crash to stop him and Cortex. It's a really neat touch. Though the story is not the only element that's been given a lot more meat, the gameplay of Crash 2 compared to the original is practically night and day. For one, Crash controls infinitely better this time around, and not just because you're now able to move him around with the analog stick though that certainly is a plus. His movement both on the ground and in the air is far less stiff than before, nor is there nearly as bad of a delay in starting or stopping, so you definitely feel a lot more in control over Crash's movement this time around. On top of that, he's also got some new tools in his arsenal. He can still jump and spin, but now he can also slide, crawl, body slam, climb on monkey bars, and perform the fabled slide jump, which provides far more distance and height in your jump than a regular one would. Even with just these few extra abilities, Crash feels a lot more fun to play as than he was in Crash 1, and the game takes full advantage of all these new abilities with the level design and new enemies, as well as unintentionally giving the player the ability to sequence break at certain points thanks to the slide jump. The new abilities also extend out to the additional playstyles in Crash 2. The animal riding levels from Crash 1 come back, and not only are the controls in these much better than before, but the Warthog's been replaced by the ever so adorable Polar. Animal riding's not the only alternate playstyle this time around though. New to this game is a jet board in the upstream levels, allowing you to zip around on the river as you avoid mines and whirlpools. This one's a lot of fun to use. What's not fun to use, on the other hand, is the other playstyle introduced in Crash 2, the jetpack. It's got a rather unconventional control style, using the face buttons to move forward and backwards since the directional inputs need to move you up and down, and even that aside, the jetpack just feels really sluggish to use. Fortunately, you only use it in the final world, so it's not around for long. Though on the topic of levels, much like with the first game, I find them kinda hit or miss. Though there's definitely more hits than misses this time around. Some of the issues from Crash 1 do carry over, like the blind leaps of faith, the camera not being pulled back enough when backtracking, and the freaking dark levels. They're not tied to Aku Aku anymore, yes, but these fire 
Firefly things just don't last long enough for some of the challenges you're expected to do. With that said, there definitely have been improvements overall. Again, the animal riding levels are far more fun, and the jet board's a great addition, but alongside that, stuff like the boulder chase levels have been improved with a slightly better camera. Also, one of the chase levels has you running from giant polar bears, and the final section of the level fuses this with animal riding, and this alone is probably one of my favorite parts of the game. Also, with the improved controls, small platform jumps are far less nerve-wracking. And speaking of less nerve-wracking, not only do you not have to get all the crates on one life to get the gem, but now there's a crate counter, allowing you to see how many you've broken, as well as a total crate count at the end of the level, so you know how many you missed. Though this of course brought forth the now infamous one crate curse that many a Crash player has suffered. And instead of requiring one run to get the gem, Crash 2 introduces Death Roots, bonus round-esque sections that can only be accessed if you get to the platform without dying prior. I think this is a final alternative, even if some of the Death Roots get a little too overkill. Looking at you, Cold Heart Crash. Now while the levels as a whole are structurally much better than Crash 1's, I do have some... new problems with some of them. For one, while the environments themselves look great, I feel like the game kind of lacks an environment variety. Level themes are reused a lot in this game, and with very little to distinguish levels of the same theme from one another. Now yes, Crash 1 reused level themes, but no theme was ever reused more than once. Meanwhile, some level themes in 2 are used as much as four different times. It also doesn't help that unlike Crash 1, there's no thematic cohesion across the levels. Like I said before, Crash 1's levels gradually progress from the livelier natural region to the darker man-made areas. With Crash 2, it more so goes through the motions of platformer locations, especially with snow levels. There are four different types of snow levels in this game. Not four snow levels, four different types of snow levels. And when added together, there's a total of 11 snow levels. That's nearly half of the game's full lineup. Though my other major issue with the game ties into the levels as well. Probably an attempt to spice up the gameplay, Crash 2 introduces a plethora of secrets. Whether it be accessing secret levels, finding the colored gems, stuff like that. I have absolutely nothing wrong with that. I like me a good secret. But my problem comes down with just how secret they can be. Like we're talking, you'd need a strategy guide to know about these kind of secrets. For example, to access the green colored gem, you need to jump through an otherwise normal wall. It's a fake wall in reality, but there's literally no way you'd know this. Or the blue gem, which requires you to beat the first level without breaking a single crate. Or to access the secret levels, you need to stand at certain points in certain levels to be warped away. And these can be as vague as this platform to the side with an enemy on it, or this platform in a jetboard section that requires you to jump on crates over to it rather than get on the jetboard. Or my personal favorite, sarcastically, backtracking at the end of the polar bear chase level and touching polar. How on earth is anyone supposed to figure these out? The ones that drive me the most crazy though are the secrets that actively work against the game's established rules. The two examples I have are this one in the polar bear chase level where, to get the crate gem, you need to access a secret area by jumping into what looks like an ordinary death pit. Now yes, these planks at the end of the edge don't break, but like, the player has long since learned that jumping into pits is bad. Who's gonna think to do exactly what the game's taught them not to do? And the other one that bugs me is this one here. For the entire game, the nitro crates have worked one simple way. You touch them, they blow up. So don't touch them. And now here you provide a nitro crate staircase you gotta climb up to get to a secret area. As someone who studied game design, this one genuinely frustrates me. Like yes, the staircase formation is suspicious, but you've actively taught the player that nitros are bad to touch, and now you're expecting them to do the exact opposite of what they've been taught. I don't like to put it bluntly like this, but that's just not good game design. Okay, okay, I'll get off my soapbox now. These elements definitely bug me and hold the game back for me a bit more, but I wouldn't say they ruin the experience. So with that said, I want to share a few other things I liked about the game. For one, I really like the new level select system. Instead of using a linear world map, Crash 2 has a multi-floor warp room, allowing you to do any of the levels in a world in any order. Yes, you will still need to get the crystal in each of them to progress, but having the option to choose the order you tackle the levels is a nice feature. Additionally, as I noted earlier, the environments look great, and the character designs have definitely gotten some refinements compared to the first game. Crash especially looks quite a bit better than he did before, and I gotta say, I have a bit of a soft spot for this design. Not so much with the promotional renders, but his in-game model is kind of adorable in a way, and I'm comfortable in saying this is my second favorite in-game look for Crash in the entire series, right behind his new Crash 4 design. The music's also quite top-notch. Granted, I wouldn't say it's the most memorable OST in the series, but it does have some memorable tunes, with the upstream level theme being a particular favorite. And speaking of audio, let's talk about the voice acting. In the previous game, all the characters were voiced by Brendan O'Brien. But this time around, while O'Brien did stick around for a good chunk of the cast, we also got the inclusion of Vicky Winters as Coco, who admittedly is... My battery is fried. Make yourself useful, big brother, and bring an extra battery for me. 
Eh, that could have used some work. But easily the most notable addition to the voice cast is one of the kings of villainous acting, Clancy Brown, as Dr. Cortex. And he does a fantastic job in the role. Uh, what is your problem, Clancy Coot? I will not ask you again to bring me the crystals! And speaking of villains, the boss fights are an improvement over Crash 1 as well. Some are a bit on the easy side, like the Komodo Brothers, but bosses like Engine and Tiny Tiger, oh sorry, Taz Tiger, have some cool ideas present that make them pretty memorable. Now granted, the final battle against Cortex is kind of pathetic and not good, but I've had that song and dance before, so I won't repeat myself. And this is a bit nitpicky, but I'm not a big fan of accessing the bosses via the warp room elevator. Yes, you can reaccess these fights by holding a certain button combo as you go up, but I do prefer just having a more conventional way to refight bosses. And yeah, that's Crash 2. I know I had a lot of negative stuff to say, but to re-clarify, I do like this game. It's got a fair amount of design choices that I'm definitely not a fan of, but I did have fun playing through it again. And while I wouldn't call it my favorite in the trilogy, I do see why others do. And I definitely wouldn't consider it my least favorite in the trilogy now, that definitely goes to Crash 1. But now the question arises, would I recommend trying this version out, or sticking with the Insane version? Well, to be honest, I actually kind of like the PS1 version more. Not to say the Insane version's bad, but the refinements made in the Insane version are far less than they were in Crash 1's case, with many of the things I don't like about 2 applying to both versions. And speaking personally, I think the PS1 version overall looks better and in some ways plays a bit better. Then again, I've come to the recent realization that I'm not a huge fan of the way Insane looks as a whole. Seriously, we went from this to this. Those Crash 4 redesigns were definitely a good call, the more I think about it. And now we find ourselves at the end of the trilogy with Crash Bandicoot Warped. Or rather, Crash Bandicoot Warped! Now, any longtime viewers of mine might recall that in one of my videos, I declared Warped as being my favorite game of all time. I wouldn't say that's accurate nowadays, and before anyone brings up my remark from the Crash Racing Games video, it's not CTR either, but I'll save that for another day. But I still have a lot of fond memories of Warped, as it was easily the game of the trilogy that I played the most. And going back to it now for this marathon... Yeah, I still love it. But I'll do what I can to not let my biases take the wheel. I'll give it the same look over that I did to the first two games. So much like how Crash 2 started where Crash 1 ended, Warped starts right after 2's 100% ending, where Embryo used the gems to power his laser beam and destroy Cortex's space station. However, said space station comes crashing down to Earth, conveniently destroying a temple that was holding an ancient evil captive. Aku Aku's twin mask brother... Uka Uka, Naughty Dog applying the Alucard convention of character naming I see. As it turns out, Uka Uka has been Cortex's master all along, commanding him from his temple prison to fulfill his desire of world domination. And of course, he ain't too happy about Cortex's failures. Cortex tries to defend himself, leading to this really awkwardly delivered line. We've had a few unfortunate setbacks? Almost feels like Clancy Brown was unsure about the choice of wording while recording. They probably should have done another take. So despite Uka Uka's anger, Cortex's failure did result in his freedom. So he decides to spare the scientist and begin preparations for a new plan, gathering up the power crystals from different time periods using a time machine known as the Time Twister, a creation of Crash 3's other new villain, Dr. Nefarious Troopy. Unfortunately for the villains, Uka Uka cackled a little too loudly as he escaped, immediately catching Aku Aku's attention and allowing the heroes to spring into action pretty much right away. Using the Time Twister, Aku Aku sends Crash and Coco through various time periods to collect the crystals, and by extension the gems and, new to this game, relics, before the baddies can. So yeah, Crash 3 goes back to keeping the story on the simpler side compared to 2. No Cortex trying to trick Crash or anything, just a time hopping adventure to stop Uka Uka and Cortex. Now gameplay wise, Crash 3 follows closely in Crash 2's shoes, retaining the previous game's controls and moveset for Crash. Because hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That said, Warped does add some new tricks up Crash's lack of sleeves in the form of unlockable abilities. After every boss fight, Crash gets a new move added, not unlike how the Mega Man games do so. Some are a bit more on the situational side, such as the Body Slam upgrade and the Wumpa Bazooka, the former especially since the Body Slam upgrades used to break locked crates, something that doesn't even show up until you get the power up and were breakable with a regular Body Slam in Crash 2, so... Yeah, but the other three power-ups in the right hands can completely change how one plays the game. These power-ups are a double jump, a tornado spin upgrade that increases the range, speed, and use length, and the crash dash, allowing you to run faster. You're able to use the death tornado spin out of a double jump, meaning you can use it as a glide of sorts. And when you combine these with your already existing slide jump, you can break this game like a twig. These come especially in handy with the time trial challenges, which is also where the crash dash factors in the most, but we'll get to that shortly. Warped also carries over the warp room system of Crash 2, allowing you to choose the order that you tackle the levels of a world. Once again, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. 
Actually, that's not 100% true, since they do change the structure of the warp room this time around, including much easier access to bosses once you've beaten them. So with that in mind, yeah, I do prefer this warp room layout. Plus, these level portals just look really freaking cool. Though on the topic of levels, this is definitely my favorite set of platforming levels in the trilogy. For one, with the whole time travel plotline, there's a real nice variety of locales this time around, from medieval villages to Egyptian temples, from the prehistoric era to a futuristic city, there's quite a bit to offer with the places you travel to. Now granted, the game does have a bit of that issue Crash 2 had with reusing environments, but Warped does make more of an effort to make reused level themes stand out from one another, whether that be tweaks to the scenery or bringing in a level exclusive gimmick. Yes, there's four Egyptian temple levels, but one of them has this rising and falling water mechanic, and one of them is a freaking dark level! Why does every single game have these?! I also find that these levels don't have nearly as much nonsense in them as Crash 1 or 2. Not as many as extreme platforming challenges, not as many game guidey secrets, though the few it does have are arguably even more cryptic than the ones in 2. For example, there's one secret level you access by letting a very specific pterodactyl enemy grab you. Definitely not a fan of that. But yeah, the levels aren't necessarily easy, but I'd argue they're overall more of a fair challenge compared to the series' past endeavors. The backtracking still sucks though. Now, of course, I'm sure many of you familiar with this series have noticed that there's a certain element of warp that I haven't brought up yet, but worry not, I shall address it now. Probably the most notable addition in Warped was Naughty Dog's desire to experiment far more with different playstyles, resulting in many, many different types of playstyles. Out of the 30 levels in the game, only half of them are pure platforming levels. The others range from the returning animal riding gameplay to a whole bunch of new mechanics and gimmicks. Now for many Crash fans, this has made Warped less desirable, and plays a contributing factor in why some see Crash 2 as the best of the trilogy. So allow me to provide my own take on the matter. I like them for the most part. This isn't even nostalgia speaking, I personally like these means of changing up the gameplay a bit. Especially since all but one of the alternate gameplay styles still follow the platforming gameplay's design structure. The hallway-like level design, the crate collecting, all that. Now granted, this isn't the same a fan of all the alternate gameplay styles. For example, the underwater levels kinda suck. The swimming controls feel off, and some of the enemy and obstacle placement can get a bit cruel, especially when you're doing the time trial challenges. I also think the plane levels are just kind of okay. I used to outright hate these things as a kid, but going back, they're not terrible, just okay. They're open range dogfight levels where you need to destroy Cortex's aircrafts, but the enemy planes are awfully aggressive, and anytime you shoot one down, they respawn about a second or two later, so they can get pretty annoying. I do like the racing level in the plane though, that one's pretty fun. Now on the flip side, there's the motorcycle levels, which I actually quite like. Yeah, the turning's a little bit stiff, but for what you need to do, it works perfectly fine. Getting the gem on these can be annoying though, since you can't reverse if you miss a crate, nor can you just die to reset since you can't die in these levels and there's no checkpoints. And as I noted earlier, the animal riding levels make a return, this time with you playing as Coco, riding a baby tiger across the Great Wall of China mid-construction. These are easily my favorite of the animal riding levels in the trilogy, and out of all the rideable animals, Pura is easily the most adorable. Why yes, I am a cat person, how could you tell? There is actually a second animal buddy in this game, a baby T-Rex in two of the prehistoric levels, but he's controlled in regular platforming levels, so that's a bit different. Still fun to use him though. My favorite of the alternate playstyles though is, without a doubt, the Jet Ski. Once again, playing as Coco, these levels have you zipping around the ocean within pirate territory, and they just feel great to play, made even better by the fantastic sound design of the jet ski engine and the sound of launching off a ramp. They also contain the funniest death animation in the entire trilogy, and I will not hear otherwise. Now that said, I totally understand why all these might make Warped less appealing to some fans compared to Crash 2, which put more of a focus on the platforming. That's absolutely fair. But yeah, speaking personally, I quite enjoyed these other playstyles for the most part, and I'd rather take these over some of the stuff Crash 2 throws at the player, but that's just me. Though another element I think Warped does better than 2 is the boss fights. While Crash 1 and 2 both had a mixture of good and not so good bosses, literally all of Warped's bosses are, at the very least, good, with a majority of them going beyond that. To break all of them down pretty quickly, Tiny Tiger makes for a fun and somewhat challenging first boss, Dingle Dal has the coolest design of any Crash villain and has an equally great battle, and Droopy's fast projectiles and continuous shifting of the battleground make his fight nice and frantic, and speaking of nice and frantic, the engine fight is an utter spectacle on Crash standards, easily one of the best bosses in the whole series. And then to end it off, a climactic showdown not only against Cortex, but with Aku Aku and Uka Uka going head to head in the same arena, meaning you have to remain wary of both Cortex's attacks and the feud between the two masks. It also helps that sometimes while going into a level, one of the boss characters will pop up and smack talk a bit before you get started, adding some extra personality to every single one of them. Literally the only disappointing element of the game boss fight wise is that the Cortex fight doesn't change at all for the 100% ending, but even then, that's pretty minor. 
but once you beat Cortex the first time and get the Crash Dash, the fun is far from over. As I mentioned before, Warped also added time trial challenges, testing your knowledge of each level as you race to the finish, breaking time stopping crates along the way, so you can get a relic for beating the level in a certain amount of time. But then you realize that there's multiple tiers of relics depending on how fast you go, and then you realize that getting relics unlocks levels within a secret sixth warp room that contain even more gems and relics, and that there's a secret gem you get from getting all gold or platinum relics and just holy crap I love this game. Sorry, I got a little worked up there. But yeah, the time trial challenges were a great addition, and they're a real fun challenge, especially if you're going for that secret gem. Except the level high time, its time trial is brutal. And this is all before mentioning the visuals and soundtrack. For a PS1 game, this game looks utterly beautiful at times, particularly the futuristic city levels. I could watch this transition clip for hours. And the soundtrack is superb as well, with some wonderfully catchy tunes that fit their time periods spot on. So yeah, if you couldn't tell, this game still holds up. Not to say it's perfect, and again, I can see why someone would prefer Crash 2, but this is easily my favorite of the trilogy, and I doubt that's going to change anytime soon. And for anyone wondering, yes, I much prefer the PS1 version over the Insane version. Not just because I think it generally looks and plays better, but also, what on earth happened to the jet ski levels in Insane? They're borderline unplayable at points! But I'm going to stop myself before I go on another tangent. And with that... That's the original trilogy covered. It's been interesting revisiting these games after years of not touching them in their original forms. And it's honestly been pretty impressive seeing just how well the PS1 versions of 2 and 3 hold up, even when you factor in the remakes. Crash 1 though? <laughs> no. Stick with the insane version if you're gonna play that. But anyway, thank you for joining me on this wild ride back to the Bandicoot's roots. It's been a fun time. Now, will I end up reviewing Crash 4 next, some of you may be wondering? Well, we'll see. But either way, that's everything I've got for this time around. This has been Black Mage Maverick, and until the next video, have a nice day, everybody.